Heavenly Father, you have given to us the great gift of wisdom and knowledge, all wrapped up in your Son, Jesus, our Savior. Help us to keep him not only first in our lives, but all in all in our lives. We thank you for the church, which is your body in this place. Help us to be a worthy body for you, particularly in these times of, uh, of disease and uh, in many places despair. Allow us to be the light of hope that you've called us to be. We pray for those in our congregation who struggle with illness. We ask your blessing on the caregivers that tend to them. And keep us this day in your care and keep us curious. Give us great curiosity as to what we might find in your word. All this we pray in the name of he who is our, him who is our wisdom and knowledge, our Savior Jesus. Amen. Um, Did you well, give an update on Gene Kragness? Yeah, Gene, uh, we finally got in touch with him yesterday, and he's doing well. He sounds good. Um, I don't think he's being moved. Let's see, he's being moved to a rehab facility, I think, as is Earl Thomas. Uh, Gene Kragness. Gene used who's... to sit somewhere about there. Oh. Yeah. yeah. With a walker. Yeah. Big guy with a walker. He's been in the hospital since October. October. Yeah, he used to fly for um, United, I think, uh, Transatlantic United. Uh, and just uh, his stories are great. I mean, he's just a wonderful guy, but he's, he was pretty sick for a long time. So hopefully he's, he's on the other end of it. Uh, Earl Thompson, Earl Thomas uh, is going to Gulf Coast Rehab. He's, he's uh, there. And he's Cypress there. Cove. What's, oh, Cypress Cove, yeah, thank you. He's been moved from Cypress Cove. Why is our screen blank? Do we know? Oh, no. So, Matthew, help. Okay, <laughs> you know here, huh? Um, so, yeah, so we keep these folks in our prayers each day. Okay. I'm not sure my jokes are good enough to warrant waiting that we get back online for them. So, which is a nice way of saying these people aren't missing much. Okay, <laughs> Zoom, so we get into Zoom, click Zoom. There you go. Okay. I thought they were kind of cute though. Um, a police officer sees a car going down the road, weaving back and forth, and he takes off after it. He pulls up alongside of it and he sees the driver is a little old lady who is knitting while she is driving. He can't believe it. He yells at her, pull over, pull over. And she responds, no, it's a scarf. <laughs> see, the nice thing about masks is I can't see whether you're laughing or not. Okay. Um, th th this one is equally as lame. A cop pulls a woman over and says, let me see your driver's license, lady. The woman replies, I wish you people would get it together. One day you take away my license, the next day you ask me to show it to you. <laughs> okay. I loosened them up, man. So there we oh, go. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> okay. Please, um, open to chapter one. We still got a little bit of chapter one to wrap up in um, Colossians. Um, let me do just a, a bit of a review for you. Uh, we looked last week at the uh, historical, the geographical setting of the Colossian church. Uh, this is a, the year approximately 60 to 62 AD. We noted that Paul was imprisoned in Rome. He was visited by um, uh, Epaphras, an elder in the Colossian church. Maybe Epaphras was uh, the founding missionary, maybe the pastor of the church. Um, everything's going well. There's really no concerns, Epaphras has reported. The church is growing and uh, there's unity yeah. and all that. Not. But, he says, but there are false teachers. No, they've, there are. They've come into the church and they're spreading strange teachings, a kind of a, a syncretistic. Syncretistic means it's coming from all sorts of directions, it's blending into one. Uh, different cultures, traditions. There are Gnostic teachings. We looked a little bit about yeah, what Gnosticism was. Uh, so there are some legalistic Jewish teachings yeah. mixed yeah, with uh, a little, throwing a little bit of mysticism. So that kind of lightens yeah. things up a bit. There's angel worship. Paul has personally not visited the church. He's going to tell us that today. But Epaphras has given him some really good background oh, material. You did that. Get it. <laughs> so I, did, he, I didn't touch it before. Okay. So he writes this first. Um, Sorry. Uh, writes this epistle to first encourage the young church, but also to warn them about drifting from the core of their faith. And the core of their faith is very simple. It's Jesus Christ and him crucified. 
So we're going to pick this up today at uh, verse 21. We'll complete the first chapter and we'll move into uh, the second. If you remember where we left off last week, I'm assuming you can still hear me through this shield, right? Okay, good. Um, where we left off last week was this beautiful hymn to Christ, a poem that uh, oftentimes we'll use it in church as a confession of faith because it just uh, it strikes to the strikes to the heart. And so here you are, you're floating up on the clouds with this the hymn to Christ, and he's all things, and he's head of the body, the church. And now we have to come down to earth, okay? With somebody, I guess, Margaret, you've been doing the readings, huh? So that the folks at home can hear. Uh, verses 21 to 23, chapter 20, 1. 21 to 23. <clears throat> and you who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. Okay, thank you. All right. So someone says this is, um, is one of these chapters where it's kind of like when you're a shopping mall. You know, it's, maybe it's a new shopping mall. You've never been there before. And the first thing you look for is one of those signboards, you know, and it's got all of the stores. And then somewhere in the middle, there's this little arrow and what does it say? You are here. You are here. So this is what Paul is saying now. You are here. Okay, we got to get down to earth. All right. Um, where were we, verse 21, prior to our relationship with Jesus? Where were we prior to our relationship with Jesus? Verse 21. Alienated. Alienated. And um, Margaret's translation, which I think is probably yours if you have the ESV, alienated and hostile hostile yeah okay hostile in mind that's kind of strange what does that mean to be alienated and hostile in mind get a picture of that what's that not with it you're not with it that's for sure okay you don't want to be with it you don't want to be with it says glue and mary you're what you're separated from God and you're angry. You're separated from God and angry. That's a good translation. You're separated from God and you're angry and you're angry at so many around you, right? Uh, because you're, if you're not grounded in something that, that has life, uh, you're just going to strike out. Somebody has said this is probably the angriest that the United States has ever been. Uh, I mean, not, not just the storming of the Capitol, which was an outrageous, raging raging move but you look around you everyone's arguing about something you know and you want to just say let's all take a deep breath shall we and close our eyes and maybe even say the lord's prayer okay but we, we just we have to get grounded in something and paul says that's kind of what you were like before christ how does it feel then to be on the other side holy and blameless and above reproach if someone says to you you know, I find you just holy and blameless and above reproach. <laughs> How do you respond to that? <laughs> you, you don't really know me. Uh, yeah, you don't really know me, kid. Bless. Yeah, you feel blessed, don't you? Because holy, blameless, above reproach didn't come from within you, did it? It came from Christ. It came from outside of you. Okay, so now, now we're getting grounded. You are here, no longer alienated uh, and hostile but holy, blameless, above reproach. Ah, but there's a catch in verse 23. What's the catch? Um, provided that you continue in the faith. Provided that you continue in the faith, which I think we all, we all need to remind ourselves of all the time. Um, it's not just well, I've arrived. Whew, thank God. I am now holy, blameless, and above reproach, so I can do whatever it is that I want to do and think whatever I want to think and go wherever I want to go because I am holy and blameless and above reproach, don't you know? Huh? No, it, it's a strange um, paradox, this Christian life that we live. Because, yes, we're given everything. Yes, this is who we are. Um, yes, it is a gift to us. We didn't earn it. But at the same time, 
it's something that if we don't tend it, can easily slip away from us. And I think as, as we go on to this, Paul talks about a struggle. I'm, I'm going through a struggle. And I think the struggle is worrying that a church which now has been, uh, in, at least in one faction of the church, <laughs> excuse me, has been taken away from legalism. Legalism says you must do this, you must do that, you must do that. And then you are. It's been taken out of that to say, no, you, you, you don't live your life legalistically. You live your life by grace. Ah, I've said it before. God likes to forgive sins. I like to sin. It's a perfect arrangement, right? Yeah. So what difference does it make? So that's that, that kind of struggle that, that, that we have here. Um, if you continue steadfast in the faith. Um, verses 24 to 29. Paul's going to get a little personal with this now. Twenty-four to twenty-nine. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known, the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. To them, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. Thank you. Okay, verse 24 sounds a little strange when you stop to think of it. If someone said to you, and you knew they'd been having a real tough time, you know, maybe COVID, maybe family difficulties, maybe financial difficulties, and they said to you, you know, I really rejoice in my sufferings. <laughs> what would you think? Uh, oh, you're a little <laughs> nuts. That's a nice way of saying it. Yeah. <laughs> You need a new what? Jacket. A new jacket. That's a straight jacket. A straight jacket. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I rejoice in my... I came across the uh, a neat translation. I don't think this was um, uh, Peterson's message, but uh, Paul says, now I'm having a celebration of my suffering. Woohoo! Isn't that great? I'm celebrating my suffering. Okay. What? Why is, is he so rejoicing? What is the source of Paul's joy? Yeah. Now you, we we know that he's imprisoned. Is he is he talking about a part of the suffering being imprisonment? Yeah, hard to say. Physically, not so. Somebody pointed out. Dave pointed out last week that uh, imprisonment then is different than imprisonment now. That you had some fairly nice lodging. You were restricted in your travel. Uh, but you could see visitors and you, uh, you you had to pay for your your own expenses kind of like you know holiday in such a holiday um, but uh, yeah Hilda I have the message do you and it's, what I like is the first part I want to know how glad I am that it's me sitting here in this jail and not you oh so like my that, <laughs> that is nice isn't Repeat it that. I'll repeat that. Um, uh, Paul says in the message, uh, tra uh, Peterson's translation, I'm glad it's me, not you, who's sitting here in this jail. Um, so that, I'm sure that's part of his, his rejoicing, too. But why is he rejoicing in his sufferings? Possibly for the witness that he is making. You know, he, he does talk in other, in other letters about his relationship with the guards. And in the book of Acts, you know, we're, we're, we're told uh, was that he and Silas uh, struck up an evangelistic kind of a relationship and, and there were some converts there. But I think it's, it's more than that. It's letting people know, letting, letting the new followers know that even though there's a price to be paid for this new faith, the way, it's called the way, even though there's a price to be paid for it, yet you can be sustained and you can move beyond your, your actual um, uh, situation in, 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 into a place of joy, into a place of joy. Now, 
we're, we're going to get to a, a really strange one here. And that is uh, the second part of verse 24. Paul says, I complete what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. I complete what's lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church. What strikes you as strange? I sure thought so. Yeah, I could come across any number of verses and certainly the whole witness of Christ. Um, what in the world is he talking about? I complete what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. There is no right answer. And if you if you read 12 different scholars, you'll find 12 different interpretations. Okay, This, this is one of these, uh, uh, when, when I get to heaven, I got some questions. Okay, right. Reading my footnotes here, it's it's like I'm here to represent Christ to you, so I'm carrying on His message. Ah, carrying on. Lou says I'm here to represent Christ to you, so I am carrying on or extending. I'm extending Christ's message, the message of the gospel to you. That probably is, is the most likely sort of thing. Um, it, it's not that Christ didn't do enough for us. He left a little bit of an opening, and all Paul's got to plug it up, you know. Uh, but but it is that the afflictions of Christ, which are carried through the church generation to generation to generation. I mean, that's the you know that's the whole message of the martyrs. Uh, they're extended throughout the church, and then you have to look and see well, who in this age is continuing on on the message. Who is who is completing? What is lacking in Christ's suffering? Will Christ's suffering ever be complete? Well, if if you're going with this model, yeah, when glory is, you know, when, when the end time comes. When the end time. When the end time comes. Yeah. But um, but it's it's a strange kind of thing, and it really takes you back, huh? Christ, yeah. Christ does tell us, Paul, that, that if you follow me, you will suffer as I do. So maybe Paul is saying that in his carrying out the you know his faith in Christ that he is suffering, completing the suffering that Christ took it. Which are never complete. Yeah. Which goes on and on. Yeah, Dave says uh, um, you know, Jesus told us uh, that there would be suffering and you're following me. He you know, he, he didn't he didn't pitch a good um, happy go lucky kind of a, a commercial for his religion, you know. He uh, he, he didn't say uh, take up your Mercedes and follow me. Okay. Uh, he said, take up your cross and follow me. And, and that's what we do. Now, different folks have different kinds of crosses, but there is a cross to be born. Okay. And the good news is we don't bear it alone. So, um, yeah. I, the, this, I hadn't read this for several years. It's obvious, but I, it really hit me because of being a commissioned minister of the Lutheran Church about the, the words, I have become a servant by the commission. God gave me. Hmm. That should be that part a, of commissioning services. Yeah, that, that was yeah. a note in your margin, huh? Yeah. That was great. Good for you. Oh, yeah. So it just meaning that Christ's suffering for our salvation is complete. The suffering for the salvation. For salvation. Yes. Yeah. I mean, the, the suffering for our salvation is complete. Yeah. It's, you know, Chuck says. Um, but yet there, it extends. It extends. Mm -hmm. And, and that's why the church throughout the ages um, suffers for the gospel. Where is that going on today? Where are folks suffering for the gospel today? All over the world. All over the world. Including the United States of America. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. If you're going to witness to the gospel, you're, you're going to rub up against the powers. Paul's going to talk about the powers. Um, and the, the powers don't like being rubbed up against. Yeah. So, um, the mystery hidden, the mystery hidden for ages and generations now made manifest to them. God chose to make <laughs> make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of His glory. Ooh, He's going to get get a little radical here. How great among the Gentiles are the richness of His glory. Why, why is this such a radical thing? 
<laughs> Gentiles? Ooh, yuck. I mean, who wants to who wants to hang around Gentiles? They're nasty. They don't keep the law. They eat all kinds of weird stuff and they don't observe the Sabbath the way it's being squeezed. So, so what are you talking about how rich among the Gentiles are the riches of his glory? This is a real this is really in your face to the, to those Jewish believers who who really did believe that, yeah, you can you can accept Jesus as your Jewish Messiah, but, and we'll, we'll go on in just a minute to um, see what that means. So, him we proclaim, verse 28, warning everyone and teaching everyone in all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. Mature in Christ. Huh. Roll that around a little bit. What does it mean to be mature in Christ. Mine says perfect in Christ. Perfect. Mature. Huh. Mm -hmm. Okay. Complete. Mature. Are you mature in Christ? Because we're forgiven, we are. Mm -hmm. But it's that dichotomy again, Satan sinner. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Repeat that. Yeah, Satan sinner, uh, because we're forgiven, we are mature in Christ in a certain way, yeah. But you've also got that saint sinner dichotomy going for you. Yeah. I don't think you're mature in Christ until you really completely depend on him for all your worries and your struggles and everything. Yeah. Um, that, that to me means maturity in Christ. Um, Margaret says maturity in Christ is complete dependence on him and all your struggles. That's that's not a bad uh, uh, Well, yeah. for me, maturity means ongoing, growing. So it's ongoing. It's continuing to grow in Christ and to understand the word, which is why we're here. Yeah, good. Yeah. Uh, Mary says it's it's all about an ongoing relationship with Christ. In, in a sense, you can say we're never really perfect. I, I don't know about that translation there, Mary, but being complete or perfect um, in Christ. And, and, and beware of anyone who says, well, I am mature in Christ, you know, <laughs> right? I mean, that, that's kind of like the 15-year-old who now announces that uh, he or she knows everything and therefore doesn't need to do anything more the rest of their life, you know. Yeah. But doesn't God declare us perfect because of what his son did for us? Yes. Right. And and that's, you know, that's part of the saint center thing that yeah. you mentioned. Yeah. Doesn't God declare us perfect, forgiven? Yes, of course. Yes, of course. But how then do you live out, you know, you are here. Yeah. How, yeah. How, how then? And, and you, you get up every morning. I remember Luther, I mean, Luther says, when you go to bed each night, I splash water on your face, remembering your baptism, make the sign of the cross, um, confess your sins, accept God's forgiveness, go to sleep. You wake up the next morning, there's the, I wonder, did he brush his teeth? Oh, wait, I'm going to go there. Uh, you know, splash that water, remember that baptism, you know, sign of the cross, and, and ask God to guide you this day. Uh, but then at night, you're going to be back asking forgiveness for all that you have done. Yeah. Walk out of the church service and you fall away. I mean, it's just it was amazing. Yeah. Your, your first sin walking out of uh, after receiving <laughs> communion. Boom. Yeah. Right there. There you go. There you go. So yes, you're perfect. Yes, you're mature. But there's so much more. But there is so much more. And then you ask yourself. How have I grown in my faith? You know, when you look back at the Christian you were when you were, I'm pretty safe in saying this, I guess, 45 years old. Um, uh, <laughs> um, how have you changed in your faith? How have you matured? How have you grown? You know? Very incrementally. I'm sorry, David? Very incrementally. Yeah, Dave says you grow incrementally in the faith. Yeah. So it's not so you could say, well, okay, on Thursday I was at this point, now it's Saturday and I'm on this point, right? No, you're growing incrementally. And the experiences that you have in life are helping you to do that, aren't you? Uh, I mean, you know, you can, you, you can easily talk about grief until someone close to you dies, mm -hmm. right? Then, then you're in a different place. 
All right. You can talk about being sick and, and having fever and suffering until it's yours. Yeah. Mary? That's true, what you said about grief, anything, you have to have been through it. That's right. And I often think I've become much more caring about people and where was I when I was in my 40s and 30s and why wasn't I this way then? Uh -huh. And it's so much different now, you know, yeah. we all go through our rough patches and uh, mine kind of grew, kind of jumped a little yeah. bit yeah. and leveled off. Yep, yep. Mary's saying when you, when you look back, uh, there's so many rough patches, but what life does is to kind of, it, it's, it's like a, a grinder, you know, in the, on a, a, a wheel, you know, and you, you, you're, you're getting smoother and smoother in some sense, but don't ever believe, begin to believe that now, now all the rough patches are gone. Huh? And the rough patches do make you stronger. The rough yeah. patches do make you stronger. That's right. That's right. Okay. So, um, mature in Christ. Well, it's something we strive for daily. And that's what Paul says, for this I toil, striving with all the energy which he mightily inspires within me. That's the end of chapter one. Okay, any comments on chapter one? You have now been introduced to Paul and to the church at Colossae, and you're getting a kind of an overview as to where he's going. So now we get into chapter two. Uh, would somebody please read, Margaret, the first five verses? <laughs> I'm trusting that you online can hear these, hear it when I read this. Somebody respond. Yeah. Online. online. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. David, can you hear me when I read it? Oh, I sure can. Thank you. Good. Okay. Colossians 2. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have and for all who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. For though I am absent in body, Yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. Thank you. So he, he acknowledges he's, he's got a struggle going on within him. Um, and is there ever a time in our life when we do not have a struggle? But his struggle is very focused. What do you think he's struggling about? How great a struggle I have for you. I'm not struggling for myself. You know, I can, I can meet the mortgage and uh, the kids are doing okay and all that. I don't think Paul had kids, but that's okay. Um, but you know, I, I'm struggling for you. When was the last time you struggled for somebody else? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How many here have children? Uh -huh. Okay, yeah. Or dear friends. Okay. Uh, yeah, and, and we, we do struggle for others, don't we? Uh, and for those at Laodicea. And, and he acknowledges, I haven't met these people. I don't know who they are. And I'm struggling for them. How in the world can you struggle for someone you haven't even met? Well, he's hoping that they'll all believe him and come to Christ. And presumably they have. Yeah. Presumably they have. They'll be faithful to him. Uh, they'll, they'll stay faithful to him. Okay. So Paul's a worry wart. He's worrying about what's going to happen tomorrow, isn't he? Okay. Um, when you wake up in the middle of the night and you can't get back to sleep, do you worry? Most of us do. Most of us do. I, I have these little pills I keep. No, I mean, but uh, they don't help me to sleep anyway. So, yeah, I mean, you know, we can worry for some pretty good reason. And usually our worries about what's out there, you know, because the future really is not all that, that well set. So we lie there and worry about it. And it looks like this is the kind of struggle Paul is having, um, that their hearts may be encouraged, knit together in love, and so on and so forth. Uh, so what is the nature of his struggle from what we've heard so far? Well, he's not personally there. Right. So how can he make, how can he see their eyes to make sure that they're connecting the way right. he wants them to connect? He yep. feels estranged. Himself. He does. Yeah. And it'll be interesting to know, and I should follow up on this, uh, whether he ever did go to Colossae. I, I think he did, but I can't prove that. 
um, to meet with this new church. Um, yeah. Well, and it's interesting. I think it's, it's interesting. How does he find out what the maladies are in these various places where he isn't? I mean, how does that communication get sent? I keep thinking about people who have a, like some beef with somebody. And so they gossip about so and so. Well, you know about those people in Colossae. This is what they're doing. You know, you think about can, can, is that what's happening? You know, is, is what he's hearing about Colossae or about Laodicea or any of these place, places, how does he, how does he get that information? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I know. See, I was thinking about that today. I mean, email or a postal system. There's no such thing as a postal system. Yeah, it, was, it had to be all word of mouth, didn't it? Yeah. yeah. Think about what word of mouth does. I know. That's what I'm thinking. Yeah. Yeah. The old telephone game. Yeah. The gossip right. line, the rumors. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Yeah. It's, uh, but we, we do know, though, that he had um, uh, emissaries within his present congregation. Epaphras, Timothy was one. Um, and so somehow that, that got shared and uh he also was a fairly good writer from all we know so there were letters being sent back and forth yeah, a lot of people go over the realm that Paul did that he sent here and there yeah that's right mm -hmm. yeah. Back and forth. Yep. Mm -hmm. but even to bring back a report is walking how many days journey yeah. to get to you know to to get that report back so that's yeah. we we take so much for granted we really do yeah um, the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ. Christ is God's knowledge, God's mystery, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Wisdom and knowledge. Just think about that. Um, <clears throat> there is a lot of knowledge around these days. Anyone who carries uh, an iPhone uh, and who knows how to Google can get information on just about anything, you know? Um, there still are libraries, I understand, and there are people who go into libraries. There's a beautiful library down here on the uh, on the corner, um, and volumes. Yeah. And, what's that? Yeah. They go into the computers. They go. Yeah, that's true. They do. Going to use the computers. Yeah, and in Denver, they go in to use the restrooms and the sleep. Yeah. 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 That's the big city. Um, so Denver Department of Social Services has some interesting programs for the homeless using libraries. It's mm -hmm. really quite extraordinary. Um, but a, a library, the word means, you know, book collection, has all kinds of knowledge, but there's more to knowledge. In Christ is hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. There is wisdom and knowledge. What is the difference between knowledge and wisdom? <laughs> knowledge will tell you, I've said it before, a tomato is a fruit. Wisdom will tell you, do not put it on your cornflakes. <laughs> ah, okay. So from that little illustration, what's the difference between knowledge and wisdom? Practicality. Yes, good. Practicality. It's not, it's not enough that we just know things. We have a storage of facts in our head. But now what are you going to do with all that, with all those facts, you know? I don't know if you can remember some of your high school or college teachers. They were very, very bright people. And they could give you all sorts of interesting factoids. Lovely little word. But if you were to ever ask them, so what? Wisdom is the so what, isn't it? Okay. So all knowledge and wisdom are all wrapped up in Jesus Christ. What difference does it make in your life that Jesus Christ is your Savior and Lord? You know Jesus Christ is your Savior and Lord, okay? That's for sure. That's 100%. Um, that's great. So what? Now the wisdom comes in. What difference does it make to you that Jesus Christ is your Savior and Lord? Mm -hmm. He saved us. I live differently. Yeah. Yep. He saved us. There's assurance. There's hope, okay? But you live differently. You, you know where I hear this question being raised, and I've heard it in the last month here at Zion, um, is uh, from, from somebody who lost a loved one. She said, I do not know how people who, ha who don't have Christ in their life can make it through a time like this. You know, 
the death was fresh, it was raw. And, and, that's, and I've heard it over the years from so many good solid Christian folk and some who aren't so good and solid who are grieving and what they say is, and I don't know what I, would, what I would do if I didn't have my Lord Jesus, okay? So there's that, there's that. There, there's a quote by Martin Marty, I wish I had it with me. I took it out of a sermon, uh, my last sermon that I preached, um, who says, what, what difference does it make in, in your life that, uh, that, that, that you, you know Jesus? What difference does it make in taking your kids to soccer games or dance classes? What difference does it make in, in how you cut a deal you know, in your work life? What difference does it make in the decisions that you have to make day to day, just silly little decisions? You know, does it make any difference at all to you? Uh, so the answer to that question is extremely important for us. So if you wanna take just a few minutes and or take a minute, right in the corner, uh, in the, the margin of your outline, what difference does it make to me that Jesus Christ is my savior and Lord? How would your life be different if this wisdom and knowledge were not a part of your life? I don't know that I could answer it truthfully because I'm not, I can't remember a day that I didn't know him. That's true. <laughs> in some yeah. ways, you know. Yeah. <laughs> not that. Yeah, Lou, Lou says she doesn't, she doesn't know how she would answer this because she's always had that, that knowledge and wisdom in her life, yeah. Well, as Christians, we have that knowledge in that, you know, God has put his spirit in all of us, and that spirit talks to all of us, whether we accept it or understand it or believe it or not, mm -hmm. it's always there telling us what's right, what's wrong. Mm -hmm. We as Christians have the additional knowledge of knowing who it is that's talking to us. Good. Yeah, yeah. There, it's it's kind of like, um, gosh, where is it? You know, Paul talks about the kind of the still small voice within us that's helping us to make ethical decisions, which way to go. Mm -hmm. But uh, Dave takes it a little bit further. Says we we know that it's Christ who is in us, who is who is guiding us in in, in, in this process. Um, so he that, says. That has a question. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Also, I think yeah. One of the difference is that it makes me um, feel you're not so, as worried all the time. It's like, you know, if I said, let me do the word for you. And one thing I heard, I heard, I don't know where I heard this a long time ago, there was some kind of a uh, discussion with someone who had not been a Christian. And he was asked, why do you want to be a Christian? And he said, because I want to be happy. Christians always seem so happy. Ah, <laughs> great. Yeah. Uh, 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 Pat remembers some something, you know, some, someone who said, who was asked, why do you want to be a Christian? And he says, well, because I want to be happy. Yeah, we, we watched a very interesting movie on, on television last night. It was One Night in Miami. It's an all black cast. And uh, it's absolutely fascinating. It, it uh, is, happens on the night of Cassius Clay's uh, winning the world uh, title over Sonny um, Liston. Liston, yeah. And, and the, the characters are Malcolm X, Cassius Clay, Sam Cooke. Remember Sam Cooke? What a beautiful voice he had. And um, who's the, the fourth? Um, Malcolm X. Yeah, Malcolm X, Sam Cooke, uh, Cassius Clay, and <laughs> oh, uh, Jim Brown, Jim the Brown. football player, Jim Brown. And, and it, it looks at the lives of black celebrities at that time. That sounds well, kind of boring, really. But the interaction, but the thing I found most fascinating is that this was the night that Cassius Clay became Muhammad Ali, and, and he joined Islam. Um, and it, it, you kind of went with him through that process, which was manipulated, I think, terribly manipulated by Malcolm X. And um, he reaches a point in, the, in, in the, the script where someone says to him, do you really want to be a Muslim? And there's this pause, and you can see on his face, I don't know, except he's telling me I do. And so I guess I got to do it. And he buys, the, he drinks the whole Kool-Aid. He buys it hook, line, and sinker. They're on, you know. But that's sort of a conversion experience that is so, um, uh, so deep. Um, 
once you become a Muslim, you don't unmuslimize. You know, that's really tough. That's really tough. So, well, we're getting off the top here. Though. So, um, verse four: that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. Okay, let's let's do a translation uh, uh, speed dial here. What what do you have in place of plausible arguments in your translation? Fine sounding arguments. Fine so sounding arguments. Hmm. Oh, that's good. That's better. Yeah. Plausible. What, what, was you, what are you, Hilda? What yeah, do what, you have for verse four? What, what verse? Four. Four. Yeah. What is, uh, two, four. Oh. They talk about a mystery. Yeah, but it I'm should four. say that so. nobody. I'm telling you this because I don't want anyone leading you off on some wild goose chase. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> that's the one. <laughs> Other so-called mysteries or the secret. Great, a wild goose chase. Good old Peterson. He knows how to nail it, doesn't? Um, yeah. So, what, what is what is a plausible argument? Somebody gives you a plausible argument. Believable. It's believable. Yeah, you know that that really could happen. I I can believe that. I, I can believe that's true, right? Okay. Plausible argument, persuasive speech, wild goose chase. Uh, what plausible arguments? Do we hear today that may lure disciples, Christ's people, the saints, away from the gospel message? What's being told to them? Now, granted, our spheres of influence are rather limited, you know, but think of your, your, your grandkid who's a, um, uh, a sophomore at uh, the University of Colorado. Go Buffs. Okay. Uh, and, you know, he's going to philosophy classes and he's going to biology classes and he's going to classes that are just really expanding his mind, just stretching his mind. What plausible arguments are being handed to him? I mean, how can you be so naive to believe something like that? Yeah, a god. And they say that Christians are, are just so propaganda. They're, they're actually not necessarily propaganda. Correct. Right. Okay. How can you believe in a god? Show me your god. Show me your god. Yeah. Right? Is that gods are obsessed or something else besides mm. Right. Their gods are success or something else other than Christ. Yeah. Follow the money. That's yeah. right. <laughs> oh, follow the money. Yeah. That's right. It's all about the bucks, isn't it? Yeah. You'll be successful. That's what it means to be successful. Yeah. Okay. That's a plausible argument, isn't it? You know, if you're happy, you're rich. If you're rich, you're happy. Well, makes sense, doesn't it? Okay. Yeah. And in what areas of your life do you think? I'm not, I won't ask you to write it down, but. In what areas of your life do you need this wisdom and knowledge of God that, Christ, that Paul is talking about? Where do you need it? Every single area. Mm -hmm. You mean you haven't arrived, Chuck, huh? Okay. Every single area. Every single area of your life you do. Okay. But please, please, please don't put tomatoes on your cornflakes. I mean, just not smart, okay? Yeah. All right. Verses 6 to 15. Verses 6 to 15. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. And you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. In him also, you were circumcised with the circumc circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Having been buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. And you, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, when Paul wrote his epistle to the Galatians, 
he cautioned the Galatian church against succumbing to the message of uh, what we now call, I don't, I don't know if he calls it, but the Judaizers. Who were the Judaizers? They were the people that told them you should follow the old law. Right. They were, the Jew, they were Jewish people, who, Jewish converts, who said, okay, you know, it's enough to believe in, in Christ. Uh, it's, not enough to, it's not enough to believe in Christ. It's a good start. It's really a good start. But there is more. And Paul's message to the Galatians, and now you also hear it uh, echoed in Colossians, and Galatia uh, and, Col and uh, Colossae were not that far geographically from one another. You have to wonder you know, how that, the situations were kind of intertwined. Um, Paul's consistent message to the Colossians and the Galatians is Jesus is enough. Jesus is sufficient. Jesus is complete, okay? Circumcision, the mark of the old covenant, no longer has that kind of authority over God's believers in Christ. It's no longer the sign that you are in Christ, as in, as in the old covenant, that was the sign that you were a, a part of Israel. But now this is not, uh, this is not the sign. What is the sign, the, the outward sign that you are now in Christ? Baptism. Baptism, Baptism. yeah. Water in the word. That, that's what, what gets you into the, the kingdom. And Paul even refers to baptism as a kind of a new circumcision. So don't fall for the old lie. You know? And that, I think, raises an interesting question for us. How do you go about deciding what is truth and what is a lie? Ooh, heavy philosophical stuff, I know. Okay. Um, but it's, it's been re very real to us. Uh, in, in recent months, hasn't it? Um, uh, and, it's, and it's in all the newspapers, all the tabloids, and that sort of thing. You know, uh, there was a time about a year ago, coming up to an anniversary, when someone said, you know, there's this interesting little virus, and it seems to be coming out of Asia. And I think it's, it's really going to take over the world if we're not careful. Okay. Others said, you're an alarmist. Ain't going to happen. We've got vaccines. You know, it's another flu. That's all it is. It's just another flu. Look at where we are today, okay? More recently, Joe Biden won the election. No, he didn't. It was stolen from him, okay? And you've got these two conflicting uh, points of view and, and, and they have consequences, don't they? You know, look at the Capitol riots, for example. Okay? How do you decide, and I don't mean to be political or anything, but how do you decide what is true and what is not true? <laughs> Silence. Believe on the politician. B believe in a politician. <laughs> Which, what does that mean? What does that mean? You don't believe in anything that they say. Oh, oh, I said, oh, don't don't trust the politician. In other words, yeah, yeah that's don't what I said. Don't trust the politician. Uh, how many of you? How many of you buy into that? Don't don't trust a politician. Well, Larry, does. Larry does. David does. Okay, there's some skeptics I can tell. So the, the only good lawyers, uh, no, the only good, uh, as Shakespeare said, first we kill all the lawyers or something, I don't know. That sort of thing. But, the only uh, good lawyers are tech lawyers. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I hope there are no lawyers in the room. I wrote a fact for you in my news the other day that the United States has more lawyers than any other country in the world. The United States has more lawyers than any other country in the world. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I sleep much better, Chuck. Thanks. You know. And the majority of politicians are attorneys. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. But how do you describe a ship full of fifty lawyers sinking? How do you describe a ship full of fifty lawyers sinking? A good start. Oh, a good start. <laughs> okay. Hey, you know this is being broadcast. Yeah. <laughs> this is not just staying in here. Okay. We're going to be real careful. Yeah, big you know, brother as well. Well, I have, I, have, I have dear friends who are lawyers, and I'm sure you do too. And uh, um, politicians, I've met good ones. I've met others that just kind of gag you. But, uh, but that's not, in, in a much broader way, though, beyond the law or beyond politics. How do you know what's true and what's not? You know? I do a lot of reading and research and pray. Okay, <laughs> reading, research, and pray. That's a good start, isn't it? Okay. Gosh. Yeah. You speak with trusted people. What do you think about this? Huh? Right. 
um, you know, what, what happens when you go to the doctor and the doctor says, I got some bad news to you about, uh, about that biopsy, you know? Uh, and you, you sit down, you, you know, kind of grit your teeth and wait for it to come. How do you know that's really true? Maybe something went wrong in the, in, in the process, huh? Well, I want a second opinion. Yeah, I want a second opinion. Guy goes to a doctor, the doctor says, you're very, very sick. The guy says, I want a second opinion. The doctor says, you're ugly too. <laughs> so, not quite that kind of a second opinion. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Well, I think that, that's a real question. See, that's what Paul is, I think, struggling about for his beloved Colossians. They're buying this stuff, hook, line, and sinker. And, and he don't want them to do that because he's going to bring them back to the absolute truth, and that is Jesus Christ. And that really is ultimately what matters. Hilda? No, I just, if you don't mind, my thing, not, uh, verse 9 and 10, I believe it is. Yeah, not my, my counted here, yeah. but I thought it was so great. Everything of God gets expressed in Him, so you can see and hear Him clearly. You don't need a telescope or microscope or horoscope to realize the fullness of Christ and the emptiness of the universe without Him. Oh and my! Isn't that beautiful? Yeah, yeah. The ESV or the RSV, in, in Him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. Translate that. The, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. Paraphrase that for me. The whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. In Christ. In Christ. In him, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. He's the beginning and the end. He's okay. everything. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. You want to see what God is like? Look at Christ. Because in Christ, you're seeing everything that God was. That's a great translation, Hilda. Thank you. You know, it's not just that, yeah, David. I was going to say, in the, in the early church, you said, who can you trust? In the early church, that's what they always came back to at the very first was they didn't trust anybody who wasn't a, a direct knowledge of Christ to directly communicate with them. Yes. As those died off, then it would had to be somebody who directly knew some for the disciple right. or whatever. And, and just, you know, if they had doubts, that's where they should. That's right. Yeah, what, what, what David is saying is in the early church, maybe a generation out, two, three generations maybe, um, you, you only trusted those people who had had hands-on experience with Jesus, who actually walked with him and knew him mm. and that sort of thing. And then they die off. And then, then you go to their children because then they have connection with this one who had the connection with Jesus. Say, well, you can only go so many generations, right? And then where are you? Who do you trust then? Okay. And, you know, uh, read church history. It was not fun and games in those days. I mean, everyone was fighting everyone else and they were killing people off. I, I'm on uh, uh, Christianity Today's um, uh, website, which is really kind of fun, and it's free. You can you just Google uh, Christianity Today, and they um, they have a um, uh, a daily feature called "What Happened Today in Christian History." Okay, and so every day you can find out what happened on January 28th, 15 whatever, 12 nine whatever, and usually it's somebody getting killed. I mean, this is not a, this is not a happy, clappy sort of thing, you know, so-and-so was burned at the stake, you know, so-and-so had a spears driven into him and, and died, you know, said, so, oh, we stand on the blood of the martyrs, don't we, folks? This was not easy going. So what is, what is Paul saying about the identity of Jesus? Well, he's not saying Jesus was not a simple human being. Jesus was just a simple human being. Is that true? Jesus was just a, I'll, I'll, let me take out just. Jesus was a simple human being. That's loaded. It's loaded, isn't it? He was. He was true man, true if, if I took out simple, Jesus yeah. was a human being. Yes. Okay, you're going to yes. buy into that. That's great. But he was more, right? Mm -hmm. um, Jesus was... Um, true man and true God. True man, true God. Jesus was a human being who had exceptional spiritual insight into the nature of God. True? 
so he knew himself. I got you. Right. I got you. I got, right. I got, I got you going. Huh? <laughs> he had exceptional spiritual insight into the nature of God, as did, as by the way, did Buddha, uh, as did some of the um, uh, the prophets uh, in many different religions, uh, as certainly did Muhammad. I mean, what a what a mind! My, God, my gracious. So he he would be on a par with those. And he's more. He's more. He's more. Jesus was. Here's a good one. Jesus was a demi-god, a demi or a demi-god. He was half God and half man. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. Fully right. human and fully divine. Fully human, fully divine. But that doesn't make sense, Mom. Mm -hmm. How could he be fully human, human divine? <laughs> fully divine. Mm -hmm. okay. And the mom says, ask the pastor on Sunday. <laughs> right? There you go. That's that's what we do. Okay. He was the Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the end. Yeah. And there does reach a point. Uh, he's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. It does reach a point where finally words fail us, you know? Mm -hmm. we, we started off this year by looking at some of the titles for Christ, and we just scratched the surface. We only looked at those titles that kind of related to the Christmas celebration, you know? He's the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. What in the world does that mean, you know? He's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. You, you have to get beyond rational, plausible kinds of stuff because he's so much more than that. Huh? And then in verse eight, Paul says, so let no one, oh, we good. Okay, stop. let no one take you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world and not according to Christ. So Hilda, get your, your message uh, <laughs> translation out and tell us what Pastor Peterson says about the elemental spirits of the world. That's in verse, verse eight. eight. Verse eight. Hilda? Hilda, are you listening? Verse eight. Verse eight from the message? Verse eight. 13? Eight. 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 Oh, 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 eight. Watch out for people who try to dazzle you with big words and intellectual double talk. They want to drag you off into endless ad arguments that never amount to anything. Hmm. That is good. I like the phone calls, I guess. The robo calls. <laughs> There's another. How do you know it's true or false? You know, and people get that con conned out of this stuff. I mean, uh, I, I'm sure you've gotten them too. You know. Uh, and if you say yes, is uh, is is this Mr. Uh, uh, can you hear me? Can you hear me? And you say yes, and they record your yes, and then they'll play it back later. And I mean, it's as an exception. Yeah, it. it's a scam. <laughs> yeah. Would you like to purchase this life insurance policy? Yes. Okay, we got you. Um, but uh, what what are the elemental spirits of the universe? And this too is has always been a real conundrum. Has, has been a real mystery to. Uh, um, Biblical scholars. Other translations read <clears throat> the rudiments of the world. Does that help? Doesn't do me much good. The principles of this world. Elemental spirits equals the principles of this world. That's a little bit better, isn't it? Okay. Um, someone says maybe the elemental spirits of the world, maybe, maybe what Paul is referring to is in Galatians 3, 9, he talks about the angels who are responsible for the giving of the law. Ooh, he's getting some really heavy mystical kinds of stuff here. It's confusing. So we put this as number two from today as when I get to heaven, I've got this real question for God, right? So we have two questions for the day. But when you think about that, roll it around, what are the elemental spirits of the universe? There are, Paul really did believe that there are powers at work in the universe that are guiding our behavior, that are guiding the, uh, uh, that are guiding history. And, and I, I don't know what you do with that sort of thing. I, you know, going back to the Capitol on uh, January 6th, boy, I saw some powerful demons at work. You know, you talk about elemental spirits, the, the anger, the rage that was there. Um, there's something beyond anything I could understand, but the, the Judaizers in well, let's see, it's 1135, just a couple more shots. The Judaizers in Colossae were arguing that while accepting Jesus was perfectly good, you had to add something that circumcision, 
Paul says, no, Jesus. Okay. And then I started to wonder, in, in our walk with Jesus, in the church, in, in a Christian culture, are people telling us, yeah, Jesus is a good start, but if you really want to be a follower, a disciple, a Christian, you have to add on all of these things. Hmm. That's happening in other Christian churches. You've got to do, do something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's the got to, not you get to. <laughs> A uh, yeah, uh, Pat is asking what? What comes to your mind, for example? In, in some of the more fundamentalist churches, if you really want to follow Jesus, this is what you have to give up. And, and Paul will later refer to asceticism, which I think in, in some, again, not all, but in some uh, Christian churches, if you want to follow Jesus, you can't drink, smoke, dance, or go with girls who do, okay. or guys who do. Yeah. Well, um, I, I have a a, a bestest childhood friend whose son married, I don't, I don't know the, the name of the church. It's a church in Indiana, but he had to be rebaptized, yeah. you know, and, and he, he spent a lot of time with his mom. His dad was an LCMS pastor, <laughs> spent a lot mm -hmm. of time with Buddy talking about that. Um, and yeah, finally, you know, it's like, the, if that's, if that's what's got to happen for the, the sake of the, you know, that you've been baptized. Yeah, yeah. With my son, too, he did the same thing. I said, what are you getting baptized for? It didn't take the first time, obviously. <laughs> yeah, so. yeah. Yeah. Well, the speaking in tongues from churches. Ah, you know, Dave, good. Paul dealt with that way back. But yeah, we did. Now. Yeah, and unless you can speak in tongues and, and perform marvelous works, you're not truly a Christian. Very good, yeah. Chuck, you said something about the Roman Catholic Church rebaptizing. Well, I've never heard of that in the Roman Catholic Church. Really? Yep. Huh. That surprises me. I, I became a Roman Catholic and then came back to the uh, Lutheran Church and I never had to be rebaptized. I did the same thing and I had to be rebaptized. Rebaptized? Well, that's strange. No. no I, I was baptized Catholic, but, uh, you know, my, my Lutheran. Baptism was not recognized. Wow. Okay. Different places. Yeah, I guess. Maybe it's different geographical areas or whatever. So. Uh, let's stop here uh, at 13. Where are we? 13, 13. And you who are dead in trespasses and the uncircumcision of the cross. Yeah, let's stop there. We'll pick it up here next week.